so good afternoon everyone um it's a pleasure to 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 be here and to 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 start the session um and it's a pleasure i hope that the session will be I, I, I'm hope and I'm completely sure that the session will be very interesting because of the main speaker, uh, Scott Mesh from the University of Seattle. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here uh, when the sun is shining here in Lisbon and the temperature is very warm. Um, so uh, this, uh, of course, we will have a main talk, and then we will have time to for questions or to, exp to 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 have some doubts from all of you, from all the participants. And besides that, we will also have a few questions that are already placed by some uh, some or some participants that can attend the the conference. Well, uh, it's with a great pleasure that I have the, responsi the responsibility to introduce Dr. Joan Rose. Uh, she will be the moderator. She will be the moderator of, of this session and she will introduce Scott later on. Uh, when I started working, just a few words, when I started working on the field of water microbiology, Dr. Joan Rose uh, was one of the people I most looked up to. And that's still true now after, I don't know, 15 years or something. Uh, she, she is one of the main references in water microbiology. She's a professor and knowledge chair in water research from Michigan uh, State University. And she, among, among many other awards, she won the Stockholm Water Prize on 2016, which for who doesn't know, it's the Nobel Prize of Water. <laughs> so now I will pass to Joan. Thanks so much, Sylvia and, and Ricardo for inviting me. Um, I always love to listen to Scott speak um, and his great, great knowledge. And, and so I'm happy to be part of this and just this nice um, presentation and, and discussion um, about environmental virology, really, I think in the history of that. So yeah, I, um, I remember I did my PhD at the University of Arizona and that, that's where I got my training in environmental virology. And um, I just remember that all the, you know, hoses and and everything, we had to concentrate large volumes of water. At the time, we were looking at viruses and drinking water. And in fact, in Europe, you know, the um, they had already been finding viruses and treated drinking water. I think the first one was in 1966 from, from Paris. And they were saying, oh, no, 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 there's no way the engineers were saying there couldn't be infectious viruses and, and treated drinking water, you know, that they were treating the water so well. But of course, now we know that the viruses are, are you know, they're quite resilient. They're nanoparticles uh, and they um, uh, survive in these uh, water processes. And um, I joined the environmental virology or the international crowd on, on, on health related water microbiology in, in 1985. And of course, very focused on viruses at that time, but emerging pathogens like Giardia, then Cryptosporidium, of course, opened up um, this idea of other uh, problems in water um, and, and the ability to monitor for these things. Antibiotic resistance came on the scene. And of course, um, the, the um, expansion really of looking at ba various bacteria in water beyond our, our traditional iconic waterborne diseases like typhoid and cholera. Um, certainly emerged as, as new waterborne pathogens, you know, um, hit the scene. I, I think there's, you know, what we've learned is there's just this very, you know, con connection between water and food and our health. And of course, we've got one health now. So we've got the animal health uh, issues and zoonotic pathogens. And that's all starting to come together um, in terms of you know, how we look at water security and, and well-being um, in our communities and our, and our health. Um, you know, being part of this international group has been, you know, kind of a, you know, my open door to what's going on in the world and, and always learning from others, including what 
you know, Ricardia, Ricardo and Silvia have built there in Portugal, which is world renowned in terms of looking at food and water um, and uh, safety. And about 2014, this international group came together, kind of expanded, and we, we started the Global Water Pathogens Project. And this was really to redo a book that, you know, kind of, it got published in 1985 by the World Bank. We kind of all use this book on sanitation and disease, but became even more relevant as the Millennium Development Goals merged into the, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals. And there were true recommendations there for both safety of water and, and sanitation. And in fact, and sanitation had lagged behind. And, and so the whole idea was to redo this book, to look at pathogens, the new pathogens that are found in wastewater and sewage and their removal and control by various sanitation approaches um, so that we could start to, to meet some of the SDGs, the SDG six in particular around wastewater. It's really, you know, when this pandemic hit, I mean, I, I, you know, I was, you know, I thought it, I was amazed, but maybe I shouldn't have been, but the global community and especially the environmental virology crowd it came together so quickly and shared knowledge that it wasn't long by probably January 2020 that it was recognized that SARS was found in feces at pretty high concentrations and found in wastewater that the community of, of scientists that have been involved in this global water pathogens project to, to relook at sanitation came together and shared methodologies and said, this is an approach we can use for SARS. And um, around the world now, there are probably 80 some, uh, it changes every day, but last I looked, it was 82 dashboards around the world that are either at the city level at the state level or regional level um, and or at the national level, which are monitoring for SARS and wastewater and using that information for informing public health actions. And so um, this, this, this whole knowledge and this whole you know, um, network that was built really served the global community well because they were able to mobilize so quickly. And of course, then it was important to that they had partnerships with utilities and with public health agencies and government agencies. And so it, it just happened so quickly. Um, you know, the, the community has always been very sharing, but this was just really a, a phenomenon that I hadn't seen how fast um, things got set up and, and, and the teams around the world mobilized. Um, I think Scott, I looked at your abstract and your title, and I think Scott, you're going to give us kind of a the history of environmental virology, particularly as it as it involves with polio and and other things that we've already been monitoring and how we got to this point with with looking at SARS. Um, and um, we couldn't ask for anybody better than really for than Scott to present you know all of this information to us. You know, he got his 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 bachelor's degree is in Kansas, his master's degree in Indiana University, and his PhD at the University of North Carolina with Mark Sopsey, who's well known in the environmental virology world. Um, and he joined uh, the University of Washington um, there in Seattle. Um, what has it now been? 18 years, Scott? Is it that long? Started in 2002. <laughs> So I'm going 20 years here. <laughs> yeah, but um, Dr. Meshke is a, you know, he's environmental, occupational health and microbiologist, but he specializes really in detection and control of pathogens in the environment. And he works in both air, water, food, and surfaces. He works with the medical community as well as the wastewater uh, industry. Um, he's, he's associate chair of the graduate uh, program. And so he's very involved with education. And um, you I think he's really built the University of Washington's Department of Environmental Occupational Health Sciences and uh, really built over built their program. Um, he's been involved in, in everything from new methods and molecular tools to risk assessment. But I, you know, he, he's always also been involved with, with what's happening globally. He's worked with World Health Organization and also has been funded um, by Gates to actually lead programs 
that looked at how we monitor for poliovirus in um, low and middle income countries, um, as well as being involved with a, a typhoid surveillance and now with SARS. So it's a great pleasure to uh, invite you to give the keynote here, Scott, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Jim. That was a great introduction. And I have to say that, uh, like Sylvia, your, your boy's been one of the, uh, the pinnacle of the, the field that I've looked uh, uh, up to. Um, I want to thank Ricardo and Sylvia and uh, Dr. Diogo for inviting me to participate in this lecture today. Um, can I go ahead and share my screen? Let's see if I can get this working appropriately. Um, you know, as, as, as much as we've used Zoom in the last year, I just made you co-host, yeah. Uh, perfect. As much as we've used Zoom in the last year, it's always a little bit clunky for me to get started here, but um, are you all seeing my screen okay? Yeah. Fabulous. All right, so um, topic of our subject of my talk today is gonna be environmental surveillance of viruses. As John mentioned, I'm gonna give you a short overview of really where this came from because there's been a, a lot of interest in the last year and a half uh, in something called wastewater-based epidemiology. And uh, a lot of uh, the roots of that uh, point towards detection of chemicals in wastewater uh, and really originated in the early mid 2000s or early mid 2000s. And um, this field for viruses goes back considerably further. I just wanna kind of remind everybody of that as we go. And then I'll um, talk a little bit about where we're at currently in terms of the applications uh, of this technology to SARS-CoV-2. And I'll talk about some of the uh, work that we've done on polio, um, typhoid, and then now SARS. So what exactly is environmental surveillance? We, we toss this around. Well, it's basically sampling and analysis of wastewater and wastewater impacted surf wa surface waters for viruses, bacteria, and other microbiological targets. Uh, we do this for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we're trying to judge uh, people's exposure, and sometimes we're trying to actually judge what's circulating within a population. So we can use great wastewater is essentially a great composite sample of the population. And so we're using the wastewater as a means to try to understand the circulation of disease in a community that may not be evident through clinical detection or may give us additional information than just the clinical surveillance. So this recently been kind of redubbed as wastewater-based epidemiology. You'll see that a lot, including some of the papers we've recently been involved in, but it's really the same techniques and, and uh, purpose that we've been doing for a very long time. It's really not all that new, uh, but most of the historical efforts have really been focused around research and or local monitoring around outbreaks. Um, if we look at where this really originated, uh, you can trace the roots back clear to the 1930s, uh, you'll recognize in this picture, this is from a, a, a polio uh, meeting many years ago. You might recognize a few names here. You can see Albert Sabin and, and Jonas Salk, uh, the uh, um, initial inventors of the vaccines, both live and inactivated. Um, but the names that you may not recognize here or, or um, faces you may not recognize are John Paul and Joseph Melnick. Um, so back in uh, the early 30s, uh, they published a couple of papers, or, or excuse me, late 30s, about 1938 to 1940 is when these papers came out, where they identified polio in stool initially and immediately came to the idea that, hey, this might be in wastewater as well. And that was the initial discussions of, one, whether we could start to monitor this uh, as a means to understand polio within a community, but also whether or not there was any kind of transmission risk. Um, Melnick, of course, uh, left uh, um, uh, Yale at that point and went to uh, NIH, and then he eventually le left NIH, led NIH as the lead virologist there, and then eventually went to Baylor College of Medicine. And Baylor College of Medicine essentially became the focus of environmental virology for uh, a couple of decades. Uh, and really many of the investigators today can try and trace their roots back through the investigators that were once at Baylor. Um, the focus there uh, when he first got to Baylor was really still on polio, but he started to expand uh, beyond polio to other enteroviruses, and then eventually the group grew and they started looking at a variety of other viruses, including hepatitis A, Khaleesi viruses, rotavirus, et cetera. Um, 
this really, again, started to snowball in about in the, um, I guess, late 70s, early 80s, we started to see a lot more interest in uh, viruses and wastewater. And we started to see a lot of refinements of methods. And so uh, Dr. Sabzi and Dr. Gerba both came out of that Baylor uh, program uh, in terms of their postdocs uh, and, and junior faculty appointments. And uh, again, Dr. Rose and I can trace our roots all the way back through, through these, as well as many of the other inv investigators who are currently active. Um, if we flash forward um, clear to the early 2000s, what we see is that um, environmental surveillance, the idea of detecting polio in wastewater has become really an integral part of the global polio eradication initiative. Um, we use it to supplement clinical surveillance. And there's a real reason here is that for polio, only one in 200 to maybe one in a thousand cases actually shows clinical symptomology. And so we get a lot of asymptomatic carriage and shedding. And so we can get the silent circulation that will persist for years after we think the virus may be gone within a population. And so the wastewater, one of the benefits of using it as a composite sample is it collects from everybody, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. And so if we can use this, we can determine whether or not viruses are still within a population and that will help us uh, certify eradications uh, and stave off uh, new outbreaks due to reintroductions. So um, this has become a really important thing, particularly uh, in the mid 2010s, we started to see a lot of interest in this. They actually began incorporating environmental surveillance in the early 2000s, but by 2018, there were 44 countries that had routine environmental surveillance being conducted for polio virus uh, on a monthly basis, okay? Now that may seem um, like not that many countries or that may seem um, relatively meager, but keep in mind there are multiple sites clearly in every one of these countries and it is a logistical challenge just to get out and get these samples every month uh, and something that, that should not be uh, discounted, certainly. In addition, the polio program also uses environmental surveillance um, for ad hoc or uh, um, ad hoc or outbreak type sampling as well. And so we've got the routine surveillance that we do to kind of judge uh, circulation and, and look for both wild type virus as well as vaccine uh, revertance. Um, but we also use it if we start to see an outbreak and we'll start to use it to ex examine the, the extent of the outbreak. Uh, and we see this a lot with the vaccine derived polioviruses, particularly in Africa right now. Uh, there are other global pilot programs for environmental surveillance for things uh, like uh, antimicrobial resistance gene targets, uh, as well as uh, some interest in typhoid uh, and other enteric pathogens, but most of those are still pretty much in their infancy relative to polio. Um, the thing that has really been the game changer, as John mentioned, is the fact that um, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic uh, had taken hold, and we recognized uh, really since the initial SARS outbreak uh, back in 2003 um, that SARS could be in wastewater. And in fact, some of the higher profile transmission of that initial SARS outbreak were related to sewage droplets being aerosolized uh, in some apartment complexes in, in uh, Hong Kong. Um, so let's just uh, kind of give you a, a, a little bit of focus of some of the things that we've been doing. We, we developed or we were contracted by the Gates Foundation uh, with, uh, in collaboration with PATH uh, to develop a revised system for environmental surveillance of polio. And one of the problems was the methods they'd been using were very similar to methods that were developed 45, almost 50 years ago. And they were never initially validated for uh, their initial or their recovery efficiency, or at least not very thoroughly. And so there wasn't really a gold standard um, that had been proven. Uh, and WHO was holding out this other method, which was a PEG dextran two-phase separation method as a gold standard without a lot of uh, basis for it. And they wanted to increase that sensitivity. So what we uh, did to address this is we developed something called the BMFS. That's the bag media filtration system. Um, we did uh, the full development of this, the R&D, as well as the validation in the field, uh, and then demonstrated it uh, for polio environmental surveillance. It is uh, being used 
uh, regularly in Pakistan now, which is one of the only remaining endemic countries for polio and is being used quite successfully. The basic idea of this bag media filtration system is that we have a six liter bag um, that we're allowed to collect the sample. Um, one of the challenges with polio um, uh, environmental surveillance is that in order to increase the sensitivity, um, there's only so many things you can do. You can either increase the sample volume uh, and try to concentrate things down, uh, or you can sample more frequently. More frequently has logistical challenges due to the transportation to the sites, et cetera. And so uh, we viewed that one of the options here would be that larger volume. Historically, the volumes in uh, people were sampling from wastewater were, for polio were only in the 100 mils to 500 mils, and we took this up to uh, three to six liters. Um, we did this with the bag. The bag collects it. We're able to concentrate in the field under gravity. Uh, we then bring just the filter capsule back to the laboratory, so we should actually shave and save in shipping. Um, because uh, we don't have to have uh, the same types of cold chain and we don't have to transport large volumes uh, in the field or to centralized uh, testing locations. We then uh, can elute these filters in the laboratory, uh, concentrate them again, because even what comes out of here is too much to actually put onto cells. Uh, and so once we secondary concentrate, we can put it onto cells and detect live virus. Um, these pictures on the bottom just kind of depict uh, that schematic on the top. Uh, this is a picture of our, our revised bag. You see the bag in the opening has a mesh pre-filter here essentially to strain out large particulates, uh, but it can drop this bag into a, 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 a manhole or into a, a large uh, a vessel, collect the sample, uh, haul it up on the rope. We suspend it on this uh, tripod in the field, filter through uh, under gravity back into the wastewater so there's no transporting of that liquid. We can take this nice little capsule here, put it in a box on uh, cold packs and get it back to the laboratory, even if we have to sh ship it across international borders. Once we're in the lab, we develop the solution device. We use a syringe base to push a beef extract uh, a glycine into this filter to elute the viruses from it, created a vacuum trap to collect that eluate, and then are able to assay it both by molecular methods as well as uh, tissue culture. Um, I will point out, because it's going to be relevant later, um, this 10 million final volume. This is because WHO designated um, tissue culture as the only algorithm they would accept for poliovirus surveillance. And the volume that you need to put onto cells comes out to be about four mils, and they want to save a replicate volume. And so you need 10 mils to make sure you can do the molecular method as well as two rounds of tissue culture. Um, that is not necessarily the case for SARS where there are good reasons not to put it on cells. Just to show you some of the validation uh, work that we've done. Uh, this was work done from September of 2015 until February 2017. Uh, we did a validation study in Kenya. Um, we compared uh, in uh, direct pairings. What we did was collect samples at the same time. They weren't direct splits, um, but we collected enough samples we could actually get statistical relevance here. And what we could see is a, a um, comparison between the bag mediated filtration system and the two phase method, we saw that uh, the recoveries were considerably higher with the two phase method relative, or excuse me, with the uh, BMFS relative to the two phase method. And that by and large, the discordance, meaning uh, when one method detected, not the other, favored the BMFS over the two phase. And so we weren't missing much with by go translating to the BMFS. Um, but there were still a few things that would squeak through with the two phase. But all in all, uh, we determined that there was a statistical uh, a benefit of using the bag mediated filtration system. So we also did this in Pakistan um, from two, uh, February of 2016 up until uh, August of 2020. We ran over 100 samples of match sets with the two phase sample with our version one bag mediated filtration system, and then repeated that uh, with 185 sets for our version two samples. Uh, and by and large, we saw similar results uh, to what we had seen in, uh, in uh, Kenya. Um, the key though is really this wild polio virus. And you'll see that uh, this is a really trace detection where there aren't very many uh, wild polio viruses still circulating. Um, but they do happen, and you can see we get comparable detection to the two-phase method saying that we're not missing any uh, or not missing 
more than we're detecting. Uh, and that we're still getting better detection with some of the uh, um, Sabin-like or vaccine-like viruses at these sites. And in fact, significantly better for uh, the Sabin ones, which are the dominant. The Sabin two has actually been pulled from the vaccine now, and we only see this in the case of a vaccine revertant outbreak or a vaccine-derived poliovirus outbreak. Let's just show you kind of the distribution and how some of this environmental surveillance is used for poliovirus. These are the sampling sites within Pakistan uh, that where the BMFS is being used. Um, there are an additional 20 some odd sites where they're still just using the two phase um, because this was doing a uh, initial comparison. But these are the sites where they're getting the wild type viruses more often than not. Uh, those in purple, all those purple dots are detection by both the BMFS and two phase whereas the red dots are detection of the BMFS only, uh, and the blue are detection by the two-phase only. Um, so you see there, there has been a perceived benefit of the, two, uh, the BMFS. I will point out that for poliovirus surveillance, it is non-quantified, okay? It is just a presence-absence detection. They do not put a numerical uh, number on it, uh, and that's because it's considered to be uh, so rare uh, that it's it's just trace detection at this point. Along the way, when we were doing the work in Kenya, we we thought that maybe we should uh, test this these uh, concentrates for other viruses as well. And so we worked with Maureen Taylor uh, and colleagues at the University of Pretoria in South Africa to actually run uh, some of these concentrates on other tissue lines. Uh, and uh, with PCR assays. And what you can see is that we are actually seeing uh, a lot of virus detection from some of these sites. So these sites are coming out of Cabrera, Sturehi, and Eastley. Cabrera and Sturehi are uh, traditional uh, large slums, uh, uh, kind of, um, I think Cabrera is the third largest slum uh, uh, informal um, living area in the world. Uh, Sturehi is not that much smaller. Eastly A and B are actually a, were once a gentrified community that has kind of fallen in disrepair, but has a, a high uh, population rate with the Somali community. Uh, and so there were some concerns over importation uh, during the Horn of Africa outbreak uh, of polio into this region. In fact, um, it, it was detected. But you can see for these different viruses, other enteroviruses besides polio, human adenoviruses, human astroviruses, um, also hepatitis A, noroviruses, group ones and twos, sapoviruses and human rotaviruses, as well as an indicator virus, the mild model pepper virus. Uh, and we got very consistent detection for most things uh, at almost every site. In addition, we've demonstrated that um, we can do this with just molecular methods. We collaborated with Mami Taniuchi at the University of Virginia uh, to look at some of her samples and the use of the BMFS in Bangladesh uh, and in India. And they ran some samples using a TAC card. Uh, these are TACMAN array cards uh, that are basically a multiplex detection. Uh, and they were able to pick up polio when they hadn't been able to see it previously, but were also able to see uh, viruses uh, some bacteria, and even interestingly, some protozoan DNA uh, coming through in that sample. Now, I don't believe, or I didn't believe, uh, that we we're actually capturing much of this or in terms of any type of viable cyst or oocyst, uh, or, or in the case of enterovenusi, the a fungal uh, cyst, but, uh, or fungal uh, uh, spore. But um, we also did some work on our own with Cryptosporidium injardia. Uh, just changing the filters that we use, but using the same approach, uh, adapting our bag to the 1623 application, and we were able to detect uh, in Seattle surface waters uh, uh, both crypto and giardia at all of our, our swimming beaches. Um, interestingly, uh, the levels were relatively low um, for both crypto and spritty and giardia, uh, and our highest levels detection were during something called the polar bear plunge. And I don't know if, if you have this phenomena uh, in Portugal, but uh, on New Year's morning, um, a bunch of hardy souls will gather on the banks of the lake and they will all strip down to their swimming suits and run into the lake, uh, submersing themselves in the freezing waters. Um, and 
we managed to monitor directly before the plunge and directly after the plunge. And after the plunge, the levels of cryptosporidium were the highest we'd seen in a whole year. And our, our recollection there is people aren't running in and necessarily con contaminating themselves, but that we're guessing that largely the cryptosporidium is in the sediments and just all of that traffic into the water is stirring those sediments up. So once we had uh, made some significant progress on polio, Gates came back to us and they started asking about typhoid. Um, and typhoid's an interesting bacterium. Uh, it's not a virus, um, but it is uh, one that has historically had uh, concerns over waterborne transmission. And we know that it is shed enterically. And the clinical surveillance relies on a, a blood culture. Uh, and that's just not practical in a lot of areas. And there's a new typhoid conjugate vaccine uh, that they're wanting to deploy in many countries where we still have endemic typhoid. Um, but in order for Gavi to grant uh, these applications, they need to demonstrate that uh, typhoid's actually circulating. And so Gates asked us to look into examining uh, which methods might be appropriate for uh, surveillance of typhoid. And so we went out and we collected uh, or um, I guess brought people together who were already doing some typhoid monitoring, uh, tried to adapt each of their methods and then in our own lab and then compare them directly. And so we use a seeded wastewater study to compare all of these uh, different approaches, everything from membrane filtration-based methods to enrichment methods to differential centrifugation, and even a, a very old technique called the Moore swab, which is basically just putting a, a cotton gosh swab into the wastewater uh, path and then recovering it. Um, interestingly, uh, the methods all perform when the levels of the bacteria were relatively high, uh, but as we crank down the seeded levels, uh, the uh, number of uh, positive samples, this is just fractional recovery in the uh, parentheses, um, really became very method specific. And interestingly, it was the membrane filtration methods and the more swabs that ended up giving us the best detection. Um, now the more swabs are a passive uh, sampling approach and so they're inherently non-quantifiable, um, but they do give us good presence absence in information, which could be enough uh, under certain use cases. So our overall method takeaways um, from that typhoid study was there was no real silver bullet. Many of the methods would actually detect the bacteria, including our bag mediated filtration system. Um, but the more swabs and membrane filtration were actually uh, had a better effective volume that we were looking at and gave us an overall better recovery. And so that's what we ended up recommending uh, Gates move towards. And that has led to new studies going on uh, now in Fiji where they will be doing environmental surveillance uh, in, in prior to um, uh, doing a nationwide conjugate vaccine deployment uh, with the idea that trying to eradicate uh, typhoid in Fiji. So that brings us to uh, the application of environmental surveillance to SARS-CoV-2. And uh, first, we really need to understand the brief pandemic timeline. It was December 31st, where we started seeing our, of 2019, we started seeing our real first clusters of pneumonia cases reported in Wuhan. Uh, by January 21st, we'd seen our first case uh, confirmed in, in the state of Washington. And by January 30th, WHO had declared a public health emergency of international consequence, uh, and then cascading effects from there. The shutdown started, everything started getting really weird. Um, so one of the problems was, is we recognized as soon as we started seeing these cases in uh, China, that we ought to start monitoring our ports for importation. Unfortunately, the logistics of initiating that sampling became very challenging. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily recognize. Even if we had the methods trying to get samples of airline waste um, without going through at least five public offices became impossible, at least in Seattle. Um, so we talked about it some more and all of a sudden we had cases. We actually had a big cluster of cases at the Kirkland Life Center, which was a, a uh, adult long-term care facility uh, for geriatrics. Uh, and when that cluster hit, we started thinking that it was here and there really wasn't much point in monitoring the ports. We really need to start looking at the wastewater and seeing what we were seeing. And so we started collecting, uh, even during these shutdowns, 
our lab was allowed to remain open and we started to collect samples in late March uh, and early April. We were actually able to go back and assay some of the samples we had collected because we had ongoing sampling for uh, poliovirus research for seeded studies where we had some wastewater from the Seattle systems that we were able to go back and monitor from February. So um, as Joan mentioned and, and I've kind of alluded to here, this, this field really blew up. There was an initial paper published by a consortium of folks talking about development of a global collaborative to kind of maximize uh, uh, our uh, efforts towards fighting the pandemic and, and a lot of environmental uh, engineers, public health officials and other kind of had signed onto this to try to really look at wastewater as a means to uh, supplement the clinical surveillance that was coming out. Uh, and then there were a number of studies that we started putting together where we actually started to compare these different methods. Ours was just one. There was actually a large study by uh, Brian Pexson, uh, funded by the Water Research Foundation, where they did a multi-site kind of round robin comparison of methods. There was another one in Canada, uh, one in Japan as well. Uh, all of these basically found uh, similar types of information. Uh, and I'll summarize uh, at least what we found, which I think is uh, similar conclusions. Uh, Joan mentioned these dashboards. Um, there's something called the COVID Poops 19 summary run by Colleen uh, Naughton uh, uh, from Merced. And uh, they kind of uh, keep track of this uh, as, as uh, who's putting these dashboards up, who are actually monitoring, uh, and how many sites are actually being looked at. Uh, this is the most recent I could find. This was 88 dashboards. 260 some odd universities, uh, 55 different countries and over 2000 sites. And in fact, uh, many of these countries um, now have nationalized programs that WHO is trying to coordinate um, through RIBM. Um, there are some key similarities uh, with SARS-CoV um, that really kind of strengthen the idea of using environmental surveillance uh, for supplementing uh, public health information. The main thing was uh, we found out very early on there was a lot of asymptomatic carriage in the populations. Um, and uh, what this means is we're, we were worried that we were going to see transmission uh, where we weren't going to be uh, able to tell who was sick and who wasn't. And so the idea that we use a wastewater composite to capture both the symptomatic and asymptomatic had a lot of value, we thought, up front. However, um, despite this being shed in feces, despite it being able to capture asymptomatic ca cases, there were some very big differences to polio. One, with polio, we are on the very last legs of eradication. Uh, detection of the virus is rare. It requires very sensitive methods. It requires tissue culture to show viability so that you're not just getting persistent uh, molecular signal. Um, it really is a very different world than the current global pandemic, where right now, almost every sample you take, you will find uh, the virus present. Um, we also had the fact that this virus, um, despite the initial SARS-1 vaccine and the MERS, or excuse me, the SARS-1 outbreak uh, and the MERS outbreaks, this was still a relatively poorly characterized and new virus. And so we didn't know really how much was going to be shed initially. We didn't know how it was going to persist in the wastewater samples. We didn't know whether it was going to remain viable. Um, and so by and large, we assumed, uh, rightfully so, that this was a more label virus than some of the traditional viruses we would find in wastewater like polio or Khaleesi viruses. Another huge difference um, between uh, SARS-CoV and our traditional wastewater targets is the idea that um, it is an envelope virus, okay? Um, it is a member of the coronaviridae uh, in the genus beta coronavirus, subgenus sarbecovirus, um, and it's largely a, a respiratory virus. It is shed through feces, um, but it, unlike polio, has this kind of lipid envelope around the viral uh, um, uh, capsids. And so uh, it has these spike proteins that protrude through that membrane, um, but there's a fair lipid content in here. And that lipid content really makes it very different from things like poliovirus, which is just nucleic acid surrounded by protein. Okay, and so a lot of the methods we had initially developed for wastewater surveillance were very much targeted at either precipitation of proteins or collection of 
uh, non-envelope viruses via uh, a process called Viridel, which is virus adsorption and elution. And so we were manipulating the surface charges on these viruses, and we didn't know much about the surface charge on this virus. So we didn't know whether the methods we had for polio and other enteric viruses were really going to work very well for SARS-CoV-2. Um, we did uh, and were able to kind of square out um, a number of potential use cases for this environmental surveillance uh, for the SARS-CoV-2. And, and, and this means in terms of ways it might help the public health response. The first was this idea of early detection uh, of the, an introduction of the SARS virus into a community. And the uh, data thus far uh, and our initial belief was that we might actually be able to detect this as much as a two week uh, uh, prior to the onset of clinical cases. And this is just because it seems to be a leading indicator. People seem to shed uh, before they show symptomology and we are able to kind of capture it in a population prior to clinical cases actually showing up in the, in the hospital system. Um, the second uh, potential use case was trying to actually track the elimination because once the virus got here, it spread everywhere and detection of introduction really lost its value. Um, because again, almost every sample is positive. But as we started to see uh, these spikes around the new year and other, we could start to track the receding uh, concentrations in the uh, wastewater to kind of understand and supplement uh, epidemiologic information regarding uh, the transmission. This also allows us to look at uh, risks of endemicity, which we believe now that you know, the SARS-CoV-2 is likely to be something that's going to be here for a very long time although it's going to change constantly. Uh, and also look at this idea of seasonality. Um, so the seasonality case uh, happens for a lot of viruses uh, and is likely also happening for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and it seems to have maybe more of a fall winter seasonality, um, largely based on host behaviors and uh, activities. A uh, third place that we thought we could use uh, the SARS-CoV is on this idea of uh, providing public health guidance on relaxing and tightening mitigation efforts or response efforts. Now that's been a tall order. You know, for these early ones, we could actually provide as uh, environmental virologists and engineers, we were able to kind of provide information uh, to public health that they, they could understand the virus that was there. Sometimes they would shake their head and go, well, we knew it was here, it was in the clinical case. Um, but they, they started to see this value. Um, this idea of relaxing mitigation response efforts though, some of them, public health agencies have been pretty resistant to using this data in that regard. They really aren't comfortable yet with this approach. It's becoming more so where they're getting more comfortable now as this using this as a piece of data. And when we had issues where testing was really limited, um, that's where the real interest in wastewater came up because the individual testing is just much more intensive in terms of resources than the wastewater uh, monitoring. Now I wanna point out four here because this is the holy grail that everybody wanted to have uh, for epidemiologic uh, um, um, benefit. Everybody wanted to use wastewater to essentially characterize how much virus was circulating in the population. They wanted to be able to put a prevalence number on it. And some of the early papers got out of the gate very early trying to use kind of black box models to put some numbers on these things. But the more that those have been kind of dissected, uh, the evidence is we really aren't at a place yet where we understand the variability and uncertainty enough that we can address uh, prevalence in a population. Rather, what we can say is that there seems to be a trend in the wastewater levels relative to the caseload in the population. But in terms of a direct quantitative link to prevalence, we don't have that yet. Um, a couple others I'll point out, uh, this guidance on medical countermeasures uh, effectiveness. Um, the idea there is that people are starting to use this to target communities to understand vaccination uh, deployment, um, really looking at uh, areas where you may have uh, areas below um, average vaccination and wanting to go in and monitor the virus there uh, during deployment. Uh, people are also wanting to look at uh, tracking uh, variants in the wastewater now to kind of understand viral evolution. And I think there are some real potential there, um, but also some limitations we have to recognize. And as far as six and seven here, these were things we were worried out, 
um, early on, but there really hasn't been any evidence thus far that there is a big risk associated with wastewater workers or with fecal transmission in, in the low and middle income uh, country setting. And so these really are, have not gained a lot of importance. So what is needed and where are we now? Well, uh, early on, the real questions really focus on method uh, uh, identification and optimization. Uh, still a fair amount of optimization that needs to be done for some of these methods. Again, because the levels are so high in wastewater, people have been able to just kind of use whatever they could find in order to uh, uh, detect the, the virus. Um, but there really is a, a need for standardization of some of these approaches, as well as understanding the sampling schemes necessary to support the use cases. Uh, as well as trying to understand the persistence of the virus signal, both in the population and within the environment. Um, because as we are moving away from sampling just at wastewater plants and moving into the systems uh, upstream towards lift stations or maybe even manholes outside of facilities, um, we need to understand that persistence piece in order to understand the sampling. There were a lot of folks out of the gate early, a lot of untested methods giving positive results, and therefore people felt emboldened. And there were a lot of people who came to this field who had not traditionally been doing viral surveillance. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at that uh, 260 some universities, I don't think we have that many different universities represented in uh, the IWA uh, health related water micro community, uh, at least on viruses. Uh, and yet there quickly emerged that many labs uh, trying to do this type of work. Um, there were some efforts, like I mentioned, to compare methods. I'll give you some of our data in just a second. Um, but by and large, what people are finding is a lot of methods work. Um, it's just really hard to compare between methods. So the real questions now, as this uh, wastewater surveillance is starting to mature, is how we're going to use this data. Um, early on, uh, the engineers got in front of it very quickly uh, and were able to kind of show that we could actually pull the virus out but public health didn't know what to do with it. Now that we're communicating much more effectively with public health, we're starting to see uh, a need to kind of relate the results directly to clinical cases. And so the uh, harmonize between the public health data and the environmental data, uh, we're looking for coordinated reporting and you'll see a lot of very nice dashboards now trying to relate those data sets. Uh, and then you'll also see standardiza standardization of reporting. And at least in the US, uh, our, our national agencies have started getting in the, the uh, mix now. And the CDC has developed something called the uh, news uh, database or national wastewater surveillance system database. And so they are asking every state to deposit uh, their surveillance data. And they are subsidizing many of the state's uh, state labs to start doing uh, sampling and detection. So a few things to consider in interpretation of this uh, data on wastewater surveillance. And this is where maybe I get a little bit more pessimistic. <laughs> and I hate to say, I, I'm a big believer in the potential of environmental surveillance, but I think there are a few things that we're just glossing over. And I think we run the risk of over-interpreting what we're seeing. So the first thing is we have to recognize where in the systems we're sampling. For initially, everything we did was at the wastewater plants themselves. And for some systems like Seattle, it has no diagnostic value. Um, if we're not detecting virus at the wastewater plant during a pandemic, that's a problem, right? We should know that it's there. If it's shed in feces, we should be able to detect it. But detecting it doesn't really tell us anything we have public health usage on it unless we can put a firm number on it. And there's so much uncertainty variability in our methods and the transport and the persistence, even the shedding, that this becomes a pretty dubious number in a lot of cases. So a lot of people have kind of looked into the conveyance systems themselves, looking at isolating specific buildings or specific pump stations, or lift stations, to try to understand whether or not you could isolate specific parts of the community and monitor those. That has some better value uh, in terms of our immediacy of a public health response, um, but there are a lot of uh, questions that don't necessarily translate from the methods we developed here to the methods we need for this alternative sampling approach. From the sampling standpoint, there are a lot of people that still haven't decided what type of sample we want to take. Do we want to take a raw primary influent or do we want to take a primary effluent? Do we want to look at sludge? There are people that are looking at all three of these targets in various capacities. Um, whether we're 
where harmonizing across volume or mass becomes an issue, particularly from uh, accounting for things like dilution during a, a wet or dry season. Uh, it also is important in terms of any types of harmonization we need to do. Lots of questions regarding grab or composite sampling. The ideal sample has long been viewed as this kind of composite sample. Where we take a 24 hour composite in order to understand, but we know there are peak flows uh, throughout the day and we can camp, uh, narrow our compositing window within that and probably get just as good a sample, if not better, uh, than what we get over 24 hour composite. Some people say all you have to do is take a grab. And in fact, in many cases, the grab sample, a single grab, may be the only logistically feasible type of sample to collect. Okay, but we need to understand how to relate the difference between those. Um, we need to understand where in the system we're collecting, what that means in terms of flow time, what that means in terms of dilution, uh, not just stormwater dilution, but also infiltration is a huge issue. And we have to understand the frequency. People want to use this as a leading indicator, um, but in order to do that, you have to sample more than once a week. You need to sample at least two to three times. Other concerns we have, the methods themselves. How effective are they? Uh, are we including appropriate controls? Things like, uh, can we put in another coronavirus to kind of understand how that method performs uh, or some other type of indicator virus? Can we do... Uh, um, uh, comparisons to understand related volumes. All of these methods will sample, that, the ones that have been described so far, sample anywhere from 50 microliters all the way up to 10 liters. Uh, in our studies, we actually looked at uh, processing samples from 0.1 to 3 liters. Um, the methods do not necessarily scale, uh, and the, once you've adjusted for volume, they do not necessarily give you the same answer. And so it's important to recognize these volume considerations and make sure that we're being transparent in how we're reporting results. We should be reporting something we call an effective volume assay, which means how much of that original sample gets into your detection platform. If you're not reporting that, it can be very misleading because people will say, hey, I took a 10 liter sample. But when you talk to them and drill down, they only take 100 microliters <laughs> of that original sample and get it into their action. Right, so you have to be very explicit about uh, uh, how much of that sample is really being collected. Um, another big issue that we have regarding the processing of these methods is that um, we all believe we have to do this concentration step, uh, which offers this volume reduction and, and a, a compositing effect. Um, but that actually has some biosafety concerns. Our CDC uh, initially defined wastewater as a BSL-2 with three practices uh, level of containment, meaning that when this outbreak happened, we could no longer go out and just collect at the wastewater plant and, and concentrate on the bench. We actually had to take steps where we were using respiratory protection as either N95s or poppers in this case. Um, or some people decided, oh, we're going to start pasteurizing the samples and we'll just heat them in the lab before we open the jar. Uh, the benefit there, you inactivate the virus, but are you actually losing detection as well? Uh, we need to understand that better. Um, so here's an overall schematic of how we do things. We take a large volume uh, of wastewater and find some way, not always this big, um, but sometimes we concentrate it down uh, to various small levels. We'll take some type of nucleic acid extraction, which there's a surprising amount of variability in this step as well. And then we'll assay it by either uh, standard qPCR or a, drop, a digital type PCR platform. Um, now, there are some real elements you need to consider here as well, because when we've been running samples, this, these green lines on this upper standard curve with qPCR are standard curve. And every 3.3 uh, CT values is one log detection. So we get a nice linear standard curve. But then when we actually run the samples, our blue samples here are what we're getting out of the wastewater. And we know these are positive, but they're beyond our standard curve. And the problem is, is when they're beyond the standard curve, you're really extrapolating. You're, you're not reading off true quantitative numbers. And so PCR was really designed to, um, or qPCR was designed to give you quantitative results only within a specified range. And a lot of the labs are actually taking these numbers out here and these like blue curves and putting numbers on there that are pretty suspect. The other piece is, is the way we, we look at the standard curve to assign values uh, for uh, field samples in this range is to develop this linear standard analysis and, and plot a line through it on a semi-log scale. Um, and we tend to define a cutoff of around 40 CT 
uh, as pretty standard, meaning that anything beyond that, we really question whether it's something nonspecific. But then below that cutoff, we can define an LOD or limited detection where we detect the template nine out of 10 times if it's present. But even further than that, there's something called an LOQ. And the LOQ is the area where we actually have enough consistency in our, in our coefficient of variation where we can put solid numbers, very defensible numbers on that. And so a lot of the numbers we're seeing in the field are actually coming up out here. Uh, in areas that are beyond our limited detection, meaning that we can still pick it up, but it's below a level we'd get it nine out of 10 times. Digital platforms are a little bit different because essentially there you take your traditional PCR reaction, uh, this uh, polymerase chain reaction, and you actually discretize it into uh, much, many, many smaller reactions. You can, can analyze each one of those individual reactions and get a most probable number type of analysis where statistically you can tell how many viruses were present in that or how many of the target were present in that sample. Um, the benefits are this is a much more discreet uh, measurement, uh, gives you much tighter confidence bounds, uh, but the, um, the problem is the volumes that go into these assays actually limit your effective volume in some respects and can limit your sensitivity. Uh, it does seem to be less sensitive to inhibition though uh, than qPCR and so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, there are a number of formats, but the uh, BioRad right now is kind of the dominant one. Uh, ourselves, we have one called a Combinati that uses a, 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 a microfluidic uh, approach to uh, uh, the discretization rather than a micelle approach. So how we do this, this is just looking at some of the data we've put together. Uh, we've been sampling since late March, April in Seattle. There are three major systems in Seattle. There's the West Point system that handles most of the municipal, municipal area. Uh, there's the Brightwater system that kept the north part of the county. Uh, and then there's the southern part down here that captures a lot of our industrial area uh, and the southern uh, uh, residential communities where there were higher caseloads. Um, we compared uh, a variety of methods. Uh, if you just kind of look here, we looked at our bag mediated filtration system that we'd applied earlier, a bag mediated uh, system where we incorporated an organic extraction. Uh, we tried the PEG method. We tried uh, uh, looking at the sludge itself and direct extraction. We tried a skim milk flocculation method, uh, skim milk flocculation with Bertrell and ultrafiltration initially. Um, basically the result we found here is that when we compared across recovery for the OC43 coronavirus, we found that the recoveries were all pretty poor. Um, you know, we would get numbers as high as 20%, but by and large, we were in single digits for all of these methods consistently. Uh, and so there needed to be a lot of optimization done uh, for whichever method we landed on. If we looked at the fractional recoveries regarding the SARS-CoV-2, uh, because all of these were split and uh, homogenized samples, we could see that really it was the skim milk methods that seemed to be giving us the most consistent uh, and logistically feasible approach. The sludge method was very good, but each one of these samples took about five hours to process, and that's just not very scalable. So what we did is try to optimize that skim milk method a bit. Uh, initially, we were starting with 500 mils, but we were resuspending in the 10 mils uh, similar to what WHO had previously recommended for the uh, poliovirus. But we quickly realized that we didn't need to put this on tissue culture. And in fact, if we did push it on tissue culture, we all of a sudden upped our containment to be biosafety level three as a requirement instead of biosafety level two uh, with three practices. And so that was a non-starter. And so instead of um, resuspending the pellets from the skim milk extraction, we extracted the pellet directly after 100 mils we basically take a 1% skim milk, uh, add it to our sample, uh, acidify it, shake it for a couple hours to allow flock formation, and then extract, centrifuge off, and extract directly. Uh, we had started with the Kyogen kit, uh, but have since moved through a number of other kits uh, as well for comparison. What we found is, is that even though we started with a smaller volume, uh, the effective volume that we were able to get into our reactions on the back end actually increased via this approach. Uh, and so uh, our effective volume assays um, ended up in the several mil range as opposed to a few microliters is what many people are seeing. This just kind of shows some of the patterns in detection that we're seeing. And 
again, you can see is basically you, you couldn't look at a sample without finding uh, positives. Um, but unfortunately, what we see also is there's just not a lot of inflection at the plants. And so this just underscores that uh, limit of um, value for sampling at the plant from a very large plant because it doesn't necessarily um, correlate with the clinical caseload uh, in these communities. Just to kind of show you how some of these methods uh, compared, here's the skim milk method that we initially did. You say the uh, overall uh, um, effective volumes were not too bad. Um, we have since looked at a few others, including uh, our direct that bumped us up to over six mils when we optimized the skim milk method. Uh, interestingly, we've looked at a few of these other direct extraction methods. And this one in particular, the series nano is very encouraging. It uses a magnetic hydrogel bead uh, allows us to collect a reasonable um, effective volume assay. But if you look at the overall recovery efficiencies, consistently it's giving us around 25% recovery. Um, and we never really see things down in the single digits with this one. Um, so this is actually the new method that we're, we're moving towards. Uh, and we're just trying to make sure that we've got this as optimized as we can get it. Um, there are a whole bunch of other venues we can look at for the SARS-CoV work. Um, people are interested in the sequencing right now. Sequencing out of wastewater is a challenge, particularly at those high CT values, um, but people are starting to get some samples. It's just the question is how consistently can we get the samples and do we know whether or not we need to do direct amplicon based sequencing of a, a, a small range to see the variants or are we trying to do novel detection of variants? Uh, moving forward. I think both things are on the table, but there's a lot of challenges. Um, secondly, I mentioned both RT-QPCR and the droplet digital. There are relatively few direct comparisons between these methods right now, and I think uh, we need to recognize that, that we can't just compare uh, these two methods apples to apples. We need to understand the recovery methods or organisms better, uh, and there's a, a lot of just general coordination amongst the community. Joan is leading a, a database uh, on a project now where they've got uh, trying to uh, pull together internationally uh, a lot of the surveillance data. Uh, I'm working with PATH on a technical assistance committee to help people uh, develop and, and test their methods uh, as well. So overall conclusions here, um, several potential use cases for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, surveillance, but several worlds of caution as well. Nothing really standardized at this approach. Uh, we are still doing research at the same time we're doing implementation, and it's still not entirely clear, and it's certainly not uniform in terms of how the data is being used by public health officials uh, for utility. And so we really need to work on that piece of it. The data interpretation is, is absolutely essential. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people in my lab who've been doing some really outstanding work, in particular, Sarah and Nicola, who have led a lot of this laboratory work, um, but uh, all of the rest of my lab group uh, through the polio work uh, all the way out to the SARS work. And then I'd like to acknowledge the funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, for supporting this work, as well as uh, our population health initiative at the University of Washington, who funded some of our early comparisons. So with that, obrigado. Thank you, and I will open to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, great presentation as always. It's always a pleasure to see you uh, and to, see, to hear your talks. Uh, I don't know if you want to go ahead, Joan, or if I can give the kickoff uh, question from the audience that I received. Okay, we have one question. Yeah, let's go. Let's go right to the audience. Uh, we're okay. a small group, and I think we can have a lot of interesting discussion. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. I have a question here from Suzette Diaz. That it's quite pertinent, uh, by the way. Uh, it's uh, all safe is the reuse water. As as you know, uh, water reuse is a big topic nowadays. So how safe is reuse water, not only with SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS but with other virus? And what is your opinion of really effective methods for an almost real-time monitoring? I know. Oh, the you know if I had the answer, I, I, I'd be rolling in research money. Um, you, know, oh. the, the, <laughs> you know, the problem is, is that when we're looking at reuse, we're looking at eight to 12 orders of magnitude reduction in our target. 
And so you're not going to really be able to use native target to um, monitor. And so you've got to look at surrogates. You've got to look at um, you know, things you might use, uh, particle counts. Um, nanoparticle counts are actually becoming feasible in some cases. Um, but you know, realistically, pressure drops, um, things that are more engineering measurements you can do on a real-time monitoring. And then a whole lot of seated you know, testing initially to make sure that uh, the, the technologies are working the way they're supposed to. Um, yeah, because I would just, just add that you know, the, the reuse, I, I don't know whether you're talking about potable reuse or non-potable. So for potable, you know, for reusing wastewater to, to enter the drinking water supply, um, California probably has the most stringent approach. And so what they're requiring right now is monitoring of the untreated wastewater and mm -hmm. then demonstration that the treatment processes can remove these these really high levels of virus, 12 logs, right? I think is the, the goal for, for California. Now for non-potable reuse, the, it's not so clear what the goals are for the standards. Mm -hmm. The, the um, I do think more risk assessment and more monitoring should be done. There's recreational reuse, there's gonna be food, uh, irrigation for food, um, irrigation for golf courses, you know, these are the things where you have different kinds of public exposure. Um, Scott, do you know of the targets? It, you know, California uses, I think, a five log virus removal for non-potable. Not really sure if we have another number out there. No, that's, I, I think that's, that's right. And I, I think they were basing most of that on MS2, um, you know, or early FOG work. Um, so I really, you know, you, you're absolutely right. Um, when you look at the risks that are going to be associated with with potable reuse or or non potable reuse, risk assessment is is the one thing that's really going to be able to allow you to look at that uh, and understand it. And the reality is, it's probably not just kind of the general breakthrough past the twelve log removal, right? It's going to be a failure of some sort. You're going to have a fiber break in your system, and you're going to have bypass of that filter, uh, something like that that ends up uh, creating the problem. And so that really kind of boils down almost a failure analysis in a lot of ways um, for the, the engineering treatment. And so understanding that goes a long way towards being protected. What about real-time monitoring, uh, Scott? How far away are we? I mean, I think that, you know, robotic use, development of more robotics for sampling, maybe concentration, is is coming along it's not there yet where it's going to be implemented by any uh, you know system but it's the detection side of that right how are we going to get to that so real time or rapid for microbes is a little different than uh what you think in terms of chemicals we, yeah where so are we on that yeah real time for microbes isn't really real time uh, and everybody needs to understand it. We don't have direct read instruments. You can't point a, you know, a tricorder at the water and say, hey, there's two viruses here. Um, even with our best molecular methods, we are minutes, several minutes to many hours to a final detection or even a presumptive detection. And so there's a real-time monitoring um, of wastewater really should focus on you know, chemical targets or other types of indicators of failure, right, is my personal belief. I think the idea that we're going to have something online that, you know, a robot that samples for a virus every 30 seconds or something like this, we're, we're decades away. <laughs> we're facing the limits of physics. Uh, Scott, uh, you mentioned that uh, all the states are, are providing their monitoring results. Uh, here in Europe, the European Commission, uh, they have issued the recommendation where the countries uh, are sort of obliged to look at wastewater, uh, at wastewater treatment plants with a certain, serving a certain amount of people. And they are obliged to look at SARS-CoV-2 twice uh, each week uh, for the detection and then twice for uh, variant uh, detection. Uh, is this harmonized in the U.S. or each state does whatever they want? No, well, the EU is so far ahead of us. Um, it, it, it's really, it's really kind of sad. We 
we are so slow to adopt. Um, I can tell you that uh, I've been working with our State Department of Health since September of 2020, trying to bring them online. I trained their lab. I got their lab trained. They've staffed up. They got a big influx of money. They have still not taken a sample. I've done all their sampling. <laughs> so it's like, um, it, they're just, they're, they're very slow. They, they're very conservative. The public health agencies are just not fully sold yet. Um, and I think rightfully so. I think there are a lot of early promises made about what this type of work could do. And I think some of them were exaggerated. And um, there's a lot of potential here, but um, we need to make sure we're doing it right and effectively. And I think uh, the EU has done a lot of things very right in terms of organizing. So, yeah, you know, um, it is very it. fragmented in the United States. It's, it's state by state. And um, some health departments are, are pretty weak. They haven't really been funded, especially environmental health, where is where this all happens. And um, in Michigan, we were fortunate in about, you know, I guess 2012 to start down the road of using advanced PCR technologies for our beach monitoring around the Great Lakes. And this was money that came from the federal government into the state of Michigan. We set up a lab network. We now have 19 labs and they are doing PCR for E. coli. They're also doing source tracking and they also geared up for the SARS monitoring around the state. But the state is not funding this really. It's, it's passed through money from the federal government coming in. And, and, and thankfully we had some leadership there that brought that, brought this network, um, you know, and, uh, you know, into, into this uh, type of approach. And um, our local county health labs though had to be trained we're, you know, they aren't trained to do, like Scott said, they are not trained to do molecular techniques. Um, and the training took a long time, pipetting, standards. And we've written a couple of papers on this on water re in Water Research that so we're publishing Water Research on this network. And we're hoping to publish some more on, on how we evolved to the SARS, uh, using this network to monitor SARS. But it's a big struggle around the United States and it's not well funded, I don't think. In yeah. Beach so water what we're also seeing, yeah, sorry, Scott, go ahead. But I was saying what we're also seeing is a lot of um, individual facilities or local health jurisdictions, universities, for instance, wanting to monitor on their own. And then the state's not sure what to do with that data. So sometimes it's not a public health agency that's actually using it, it's the, the university or facility administration. Um, and what's really scary is there are now um, never seen it before. You know, we, we have always been in a field where we've been adapting somebody else's tools to what we do. And all of a sudden, there are tools that are being made specifically for what we do by companies like Hawk and, and other things. So there, there's, a, there's a PCR kit you can take out to the, you know, the, uh, out in the field to the corrections facility, and you can monitor for SARS. You know, so it, it's 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 so fragmented, and we've gone from you know being very conservative to jumping all the way out on the bleeding edge of the technology. Uh, the question about that kit is if it works or what are the detection limits of that? <laughs> you know, yeah, reg regarding that, uh, there's there's a company called Luminutra. They are that's them. <laughs> Canadian company. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so Hawk, Hawk is partnered it. with them to put it in a box. Yeah, right. We tested it. Um, well. <laughs> it's easy to use. At least the PCR, it's, it's easy to use. It's but easy to use. Rest, it doesn't look at very much volume. You know, I mean, it's a double-edged sword because we do want um, the private sector, both Absolutely. companies that are developing instruments, instrumentation, new automated extraction systems, you know, uh, more high throughput systems for monitoring and better kits. We want that. But the problem is, I think that, um, you know, we're going to have to come together as a group and say, okay, um, these are the criteria that are going to make a new package or instrument valuable to environmental monitoring. These are some of the you know, the pros and the cons, the advantages, disadvantages of different platforms, and make sure that we're publishing that work 
as we start to evaluate it as a as a consortium you know right. and i think you know our group is probably best poised to do that you know uh, to do these evaluations so on the one hand we really want these companies and instruments to come in but we want a, a way that the consortium the global consortium of scientists is coming together to evaluate, you know, the platforms and the new techniques and that type of thing. Exactly. Completely right. Uh, for instance, in the guidelines from the European Union now, uh, they were in a crossroads. Uh, on one hand, they wanted to standardize the methods, but they decided, fortunately, not to do it. And instead of that, they, they gave just some bullet points on quality control and what the methods should follow. Of course, this is a rough first draft and probably in the next guideline will be more detailed but uh, uh, it's a crossroad we, we want easier and faster methods but we want them to be good not to be just okay it's easy to use <laughs> yeah. the, the recommendation also says that the labs that are going to analyze SARS-CoV-2 in in wastewater they either have to be accredited or participate in um, proficiency testing. So, so yeah, all those things that. I support. Um, I think that I think that it's right to have the harmonization rather than the standardization. I think we're still at a point where if I'm looking at the performance of these methods, there's not one method I can point to and say this is the best optimized method and is the only one everybody should use. One that creates supply chain problems, and two, it it just it stifles our advancement. And so we, we just need to have good standards for how we evaluate and how we're reporting our data. Um, I do have one question about the EU guidelines because there was, there was um, there's a lot of discussion around normalization of the data. And should you use some other target um, to uh, adjust for dilution or you know, normalize otherwise? A lot of folks have been pushing towards either crash bodge or PMMOV. It's the um, same as with the... Yeah, the yeah. European Union says that we should norm normalize first for the volume uh, of the food mm -hmm. and then add additional uh, markers, either cross-page or PMMOV or some other um, physical chemical parameters. Okay, so, so we've looked at this um, considerably. There is no biological reason that PMMOV or CRASPOSH should be used for normalization. Um, they have their own, they're another biological entity altogether. They are not consistently shed. And so you will have a couple order magnitude additional variation. Right. Um, so from a normalization standpoint, it doesn't make any sense if you've got two orders of magnitude variation for normalization. The nitrogen and ammonia peaks at a different time. It does correlate during the, the peak flow for the virus. But outside that, you'll actually get a higher peak for the nutrients, uh, at least in our what Seattle. What about water. turbidity? What about turbidity, Scott? Turbidity We're seeing doesn't in change either. With... Total solids did not correlate either. What did? Flow. If you adjust for just the flow and just the dilution, it lines up beautifully. You have and, the recommendation uh, there on the chat. What's that? You have the recommendation on the chat. You just need to download it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, the, the recommendation oh, says, says yeah, I'll, I'll you take a look I got it. Gotcha. To the flow, to the flow, and then um, because of rain, rain or something, rain. try to normalize yeah. with some other parameter. Yeah. So uh, I and I is what we call it, right? So infiltration. It's basically captures both stormwater, but here we've got an issue where the groundwater levels come up, and we get a lot of infiltration in the pipes. And as much as you know, a third of the flow at any given time can be essentially groundwater. <laughs> so during our wet season. Um, and if we don't account for that, nothing else matters. Yeah, and so we have these leaky systems. I think it's mostly, you know, I mean, really it's about how much black water versus gray water uh, and rainwater can we account for with different approaches. And, um, you know, some people have just found that, okay, you take the average gram of feces per person 
and you use flow and 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 grams of weight you know feces in your population to to normalize and that works just as well as scott has said so yeah i'm concerned with people saying that we can use you know um some of these other indicators that we know also have all this variability to normalize but you know mathematically we can start manipulating our data to get those bits and the real issue is can we translate that mathematical formula to to uh, what I say, you know, um, sort of calibrate the wastewater signal to our population, uh, you know, cases of, of diseases in, in our population with some uncertainty around the asymptomatic and testing and all, you know, because we've got that uncertainty as well. I mean, what are we calibrating it against, right? right. We're calibrating it against data where we have some uncertainty in, in the number of cases, the number of people shedding. The other thing is, Scott, I don't know if you ran across this, I wanted to ask you, we see this really high peak of virus when a case is first identified. I mean, we see it prior, we're monitoring the dorms um, and it depends because we're sampling twice a week, but we see a real high peak at the early, when the first case, when the cases are initially identified and then it comes down to a low level. So I presume they're still excreting, but maybe they're excreting individuals who get infected excrete a high level. This is my hypothesis, but I don't know if anybody has any data on this. Excrete a high level of virus at the initial infection, and then it comes down and is more just low level excretion as the infection goes on the seven to 10 days or whatever it is yeah, by so an individual. I, I think a lot of other people have seen that and then kind of Jeff Soller and Dan Garrity have also been hypothesizing that that's the case. There's this initial peak and then it levels off. But if you look actually at our, our recent newsletter, um, the, the, the charts that Gurchan posted, they were, they were all over. I mean, there was a lot of shedding that was relatively high later in. So um, I think it, there's just a lot of variability there. I mean, one of the things we're working on right now, um, my PhD student, and uh, we're working with uh, uh, Susan Pedersen as well, is trying to understand um, where the sources of uncertainty and variability are and just exactly how big they are. And what we're finding is there are some things where there's enough data out there where we can actually have kind of known uncertainty or variability, and we can incorporate that in a 2D model. But the other pieces, there's just nothing out there. And we, we fully expect that they're introducing variability, but we don't know how much. And so at the very least, we're gonna identify where those gaps are. Um, but realistically, I think we need to understand, you know, cause there's clearly gonna be, if we do our tornado plots, there's gonna be two or three of these factors that are driving everything. And if we can figure out ways to minimize the uncertainty variability there, then we'll be able to get much better numbers going forward. Um, you know, and I, I honestly, I don't think, you know, things like PCR availability, technical variability between replicates doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's like 10, 20%, you know, but when you're dealing with, you know, three to four is magnitude difference in shedding, <laughs> you know, that makes it really hard to put a hard number on things. Um, so, um, you know, I think ideally we want this nice distributed numbers. So we understand where we're at. We can predict confidence bounds. But right now we're kind of in ballpark estimates and we just need to keep working at it. Okay, Scott and Joel, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Always a pleasure. Uh, so good to see your face, even it's, if it's uh, you know flat on a screen. <laughs> yeah, hopefully next year we'll be able to see ourselves live again. I know, very good. <laughs> Thank you very much for everything. And it was great to see you and to hear you. And yeah. we'll have more opportunities soon, for sure. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Have a great weekend, good everyone. Good to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.